Good evening. Good evening and welcome to this Sunday evening service of the Bobby Branch Church of Christ. Uh, we want to welcome everyone. We want to especially welcome you if you are visiting with us this evening. And we would appreciate it if you are a visitor tonight. If you would fill out one of the uh, visitor's cards that you'll find in the uh, rack in front of you. You may fill that out and leave that on the seat. And we'll have a record that way of your visit with us tonight. Those of you who are with us to, uh, this evening, uh, worshiping with us remotely, we're glad that you're able to tune in. Uh, and of course, we would encourage you anytime that you have the opportunity to visit with us in person, that uh, we would be glad to have you. We'll meet this Wednesday evening at seven o'clock for our midweek service, uh, Sunday morning service for worship at nine o'clock and 1015 for Bible classes. We do have classes for all ages. Uh,
verses 16 and 17, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and our first song is 383, so may we stand as we sing this song. Three hundred and eighty-three, first, second, and last verse. I the hope prepared where the saints abide. sing Sweet Hour Prayer 618.
Let us bow as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our God, our Father who art in heaven, we thank thee for this day and all the many blessings. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity to assemble here tonight and study another portion of thy word. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless the leaders and teachers of this congregation. May they lead and teach in such a way that will be well-pleasing in thy sight. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless the sick and the afflicted, the bereaved and the downhearted of this congregation and elsewhere throughout the world. If it be thy will, Heavenly Father, restore them back to their normal walks of life. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for all the necessities of life thou hast bestowed upon us, our food, our clothing, our livelihood, for we know that all good things come down from thee. Heavenly Father, we pray that we be soberly and righteous and godly. You give us wisdom and strength to help us be better Christians in the future than we have been in the past. Heavenly Father, we ask thee at this time to bless this congregation that we may carry on the work that we do here and we may be able to keep our work going to spread thy word. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we most of all we thank thee for thy son Jesus Christ that died upon the cross for the remission of our sins that through him we may have that avenue of eternal life. Heavenly Father, forgive us of our many sins and shortcomings. We know that we sin every day we ask for thy forgiveness. Go with us now through the future exercise of this service and on down through the future walks of life. And in the end, Heavenly Father, if we've been found faithful, give us a home of thee. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you're marking in your hymn books, number 255 will be the invitational hymn this evening, number 255. Um, before we uh, dive into the Bible, we're going to sing Amazing Grace, number 36, first two and last two verses. <clears throat>
scripture reading it comes from John chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malice. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the shield. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? As you study your Bible, I'm sure that there are passages in it that pick your interest. And in so doing, there are passages that you want to learn a little bit more about. And the Bible teaches in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You and I hopefully are going to be the kind of people that as we do our daily Bible readings, as we give a little bit of time to try to study his word, that there's something there that wants to be known and we want to know a little bit more to study a little bit deeper. I remember reading not too long ago the passage from John chapter 18 and I always try to visualize when and where and how these events occurred and I think about Peter pulling that sword out and it's dark at night and swinging that sword and was he trying to hit Malchus over the top of the head with the sword? Was he trying to stab him somewhere and missed? What I do know is he cut off his right ear. And I can imagine here's Malchus and immediately grabbing his ear and, you know, it's gone. And then I think about the Lord touching his ear and uh, that ear being healed. With that in mind, the Lord tells Peter to put his sword in the sheath. And that prompted a question. The question is, when is it time to put up the sword and to put it back in its sheath? For just a few minutes, let me introduce the lesson we're going to study. Every good Bible student knows that the sword was the major weapon of war. That's what most of the soldiers would use on the battlefield. And sometimes God expected the sword to be active and to be used for just a moment. 1 Samuel chapter 15 or chapter 17 and verse 51. You'll remember when David slew Goliath with the stone, the text goes on to say, then David ran and stood over the Philistine. <clears throat> took his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. That was a rather gruesome scene, seeing Goliath's head cut off. That's what the sword was there for. But when you get to the book of Jeremiah, which we're studying on Wednesday nights, in chapter 47 it says, O you sword of the Lord, how long until you are quiet. Put yourself in your scabbard. Rest and be still. And then the sword answers. How can I be quiet? Seeing the Lord has given it a charge against Asculon and against the seashore. There he has appointed it. God had commanded the sword to be active. And then you go to chapter 48 and then chapter 50. And there says, Cursed is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed is he who keeps back his sword from blood. I know that just sort of rings sort of strong in our ears. Cursed is a man who doesn't use his sword. Chapter 50, verse 25, The Lord has opened his armory and brought out his weapons of his indignation, for this is the work of the Lord of hosts, in the land of the Chaldeans, God had a plan to use the sword. Now, there are times also, though, when God said the sword was to be sheathed, to be put up, as was the case in John 18. In 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 27, David had numbered the children of Israel. God had brought a plague on them. 17,000 people had died. 
And what God had done was he had sent his angel, and it says that God commanded the angel, and he returned his sword to his sheath. There's times when God says, use it, and there's times when God says, okay, time's up, put it up, put your sword in the sheath. Well, now go with me to John 18 for just a minute. Let's look again at chapter 18, and let's look at verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> then Simon Peter, having drew a sword, uh, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? Now, um, when you look at that, there's something that precedes that back in Luke chapter 22. And this is where the, the text can be really interesting. Uh, at least this is what picked my attention as I started studying through this passage. Because there we read, now this is prior to the, the event he said to them, when you, I sent you out without money bag, knapsack, or, and sandals, did you lack anything? And so they said nothing. Then he said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this uh, this which is written must be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here we have, or here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Now, when you get to that passage, there's two different ways to interpret it. One is to take the passage literal. When he says, you need to go sell your coat and buy you a sword. That leads a person to believe that what the Lord is saying here, you need to have something to defend yourself with. Or there's another way of interpreting it, and that is in a figurative sense, because if you go on down to verses 49 and following, the Lord is going to tell them that's enough. And when he means that's enough, he could say, that's enough, I don't want to hear anymore. And he rebukes them for it, and we read there when they turned, those around him saw that he was going to happen. They said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? They're asking the Lord, is it now time for us to use our swords? And the Lord's answer was basically no. Permit it, even this. And he touched the ear and he healed him. Now, when you say it is enough, is the Lord saying two swords is enough? That's all we need? Or is he saying, enough, I don't want to hear any more of this. I don't know. I wasn't there to hear the inflection of his voice. I know there are times when somebody has said, enough. If you're pouring them a glass of tea, that's enough. Or somebody might say, enough, stop. And uh, it could have either of those meanings. Which leads me to the idea, is when is it time? to put the sword back in its sheath. Well, Christians are not supposed to be spoiling for a fight. If you go to passages like 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, and there Paul is giving the qualifications for elders, he says, not given to wine, not violent, which means not to be a striker, not to be a person who's wanting to pound the fist, not greedy for money, not, or, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, quarrelsome, not a brawler, not a man who's wanting to get into a, uh, some sort of an argument all the time. That's not who Christians are. We're not physical fighters either. In John 18 and verse 36, the question is, are Jesus, are you a king? Are these people your followers? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. My servants are not fighting. They're not out here engaging in a war because that's not the nature of what Christians are. 
When Paul wrote the Corinthians, some were charging that he was living a carnal life and his response to him, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God. Well, what kind of weapons are you using? Those which are mental in nature, casting down arguments, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So when is it time to put up the sword? Well, I'm going to suggest to you there's four times that... We ought to put up the sword when it is not needed, when it is the will of God, when our hearts are not right, and when it's self-defeating. Those are four things that I believe come out of our study of this passage. So let's talk about them for just a minute. When is it not needed? One of Jesus' response to Peter was that he could have called 12 legions of angels. Look with me at verse 53. Or do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? And when you start thinking about a legion, that was 6,000 soldiers. 12 of those legions would have been 72,000 soldiers. And Jesus said more than that. When you add to that, that in one night... One angel killed 185,000 in an army. 2 Kings 19, 35, the camp of the Assyrians, 185,000 by one soldier. If you have 72,000 angels, do you think that they could defend Jesus against anything? Absolutely. So it was at the fact that he needed Peter or some of these others. He, they weren't needed at all. <clears throat> He didn't need Peter to defend him. Jesus had the power to restore Malchus's ear. Luke 22, verse 51. He had the power to resist any army against him. So if we're looking at the, the question that's arising here in this text, he says here, permit even this. I'm not, I don't need you, Peter. I don't need you to fight my battles for me. And so when you and I are called upon and, and we've got a sword, if it's not needed, don't use it. But as you go further, you go to John 18, look at verses 1 through 9. As Judas and that cohort of folks came on, on with him to arrest Jesus, you read some interesting details. It says in verse 3, Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops, and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. And Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Who are you seeking? They answered to him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who had betrayed him, also stood with them. And now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Jesus was willing to go with them. It wasn't like he was trying to engage them in some sort of conflict. In fact, Jesus said, I've told you, I am he. I'm the one that you're looking for. Likewise, we should put up our swords when it's not needed. There are times when it is not needed, and that is when we should allow God to do his work in his time. In Psalms 27 and verse 14, one of my favorite Old Testament passages. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. There's times when God doesn't need me to try to help him, to try to do his work for him. In fact, Romans chapter 12 and verse 19 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves rather give place for wrath as it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. There's a time, there's a place for me to realize this is not my battle to fight. This is the Lord's battle and it's my place to step back and let the Lord do what the Lord wants done. We also should realize it's time to put up our sword when there's no value in continuing the struggle and continuing the conflict. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 30, Do not strive with a man without cause if he has done you no harm. There's a, a 
fellow that I know of, and uh, I have to be very careful the way I say it, or I could, might reveal his identity. Not anyone here, by the way. But uh, every time you meet him, he's always wanting to get into a disagreement. Always wanting to engage somebody in a debate. And it doesn't matter which side you're on, he's going to take the opposite side. Sometimes people just appear to be wanting to fight about everything. Proverbs 20, verse 3, It is honorable for a man to stop striving, since any fool can start a quarrel. There's a time, there's a place for us to say, Am I doing something that is actually now causing harm by wanting to fight? 2 Timothy 2.14, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. So I think about what the Lord has said here to Peter, and um, it's time to put our sword in the sheath when it's not needed. God doesn't want me to be engaged in battle if it's not necessary and it's not needed. But number two... It's time to put our swords up when it is the will of God. I want you to go back with me to Luke chapter 22, the parallel passage, and notice what occurs as Jesus prays in the garden. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And in saying this, Jesus is explaining, I don't want to go through this. But I recognize, Heavenly Father, I want your will to be done. Now, if you will notice the response of Jesus in John 18 and verse 11, it says, he said to Peter, so put your sword in the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Notice in the garden, let this cup pass. Now, he says to Peter, the Father has given me this cup to drink. It's my job to do the Father's will. Sometimes our suffering, our uh, being on the losing end, if you will, is the will of God. Sometimes Christians must learn the necessity of passive non-resistance. Somebody says, I don't like those words. That doesn't sound like what I want to hear. But do you remember Matthew 5, verse 39? But I tell you not to resist the evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. I've often heard people say the way that you do it, you let them slap you on your left cheek, you let them slap you on your right cheek, and then you knock their block off. That's the idea that some people have. But that's not what he was saying here. If it's the will of God, you accept it. Now, this speaks volumes to an unbelieving world. When you study the book of 1 Peter, and I think it's interesting Peter's involved here. When you study 1 Peter, I want you to listen to chapter 2, verse 15. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. When you are suffering, you can make them look foolish by not resisting. Notice with me, if you go on down to verses 20 and following He said, for what credit is it if you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten committed himself to him who judges righteously. Folks, that's hard to do, but there's times when it is the will of God and for the benefit of the Lord's kingdom for us to put our swords up and not engage in the conflict. Number three, 
when our hearts are not right. Some mistakenly have this idea that the object or the goal is to vanquish the enemy rather than to seek their repentance. To try to just simply get rid of them. And I know that it's easy when you maybe have been attacked to feel like the way that I respond is to respond with force. Let me point you to Jonah. Jonah was sent to Nineveh by God to preach to them to repent or the city was going to be overthrown. Jonah didn't want to go. In fact, he went and got on a ship going to Tarshish. God had to get his attention, be swallowed by the great fish. And then God sent him again, and he goes this time, and he preaches, and he's successful. They repent. But Jonah's still not happy. You know why he's not happy? Chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. But this displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. And so he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord God, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Jonah's mindset was is, Lord, I really wanted you to just to kill them instead of their repenting. The second illustration is found in Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 51. We learn from verse 51 that his face is set steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. The Lord's up in the northern part. He's in Galilee. He's going to make his journey to Jerusalem. And he's got his face set. That's the direction I'm going. And he's going to take the direct route, which is going to lead him through Samaritan territory. In verse 52, and he sent messengers before his face. As they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for a journey to Jerusalem. Now pause for just a minute. When you go through Samaria, they believe Mount Gerizim is where you ought to worship. You can study about that in John chapter 4. But the Lord's face is set to Jerusalem. They're like, no, we don't want you here if you're going to Jerusalem. Verse 54, and when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord... Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Lord, do you want us to just burn them up? Notice the response. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. They went to another village. You see, when you look at this passage, the hearts of James and John were not right because in their minds, just like Jonah, Lord, let's just get rid of these people. And the Lord's concern was that they repent. The best way to conquer an enemy is to make a friend of him. And I can tell you that actually works. One of the first times I preached, the Bible classes that I taught, there was a person in there who I believed had made it his goal to make my life miserable. He would study the lesson, but primarily so he could come up with a question that I couldn't answer. And at that age and that time in my life, that was very easy to do. You could be able to come up with a number of questions that could stump me. And every class was just real difficult. I even entertained the idea of quit preaching a time or two because of it. Because it just, you know, it was so discouraging. And um, I actually read an article, I believe it was in the Words of Truth, about how to turn your enemies into friends. And I befriended that fellow and uh, made good friends with him. Sometimes we need to realize it's time to put up our swords if our hearts are not in the right place because what we ought to be doing is seeking their change. Number four, when it is self-defeating. 
Jesus told Peter that all who take the sword will perish by the sword, Matthew 26, verse 52. Jesus stated the maximum that you all ought to observe is that violence tends to breed more violence. In fact, if two people get into a conflict and it's fist fights, next thing it may go to sticks, bats, and things such as that, and then they may even pull out guns and start doing even more harm to one another. Violence tends to breed violence. And to some people, the first thought in their minds is, I'll just take it up to the next level. And when you have that kind of idea, you need to listen to what the Lord said, that those who take the sword shall perish by the sword. Listen to Genesis 9 and verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for he is in the image of God. You kill someone and you can expect that same kind of thing coming back to you. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 8. He who digs a pit will fall into it. And whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent. You're trying to harm someone else. Harm can come back to you as well. You see some are zealously misguided and end up opposing the very thing that they're seeking. Or they find themselves doing exactly the opposite. Uh, Romans chapter 10 verses 1 through 3 talks about the Jews. And he talks about their pursuit of righteousness. And he says they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. So when it's self-defeating, that's time to put up our sword. Or maybe I could put it a little more plain. When you're going to cut yourself, you better put it up. When it's going to do you more harm, then it's time to put your sword up. Now, in my mind, after studying through all of this, and this was all my own personal study of just trying to look at what was here, the greatest lesson from this study, in my judgment, is, is that many have been using the wrong sword. The right sword that we ought to be using is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. And the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, is more powerful than anything else. He said, for the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Oh, that word of God can go right in and can break down the hardest, the, the most difficult person in the world. It did for the Apostle Paul. Just like Jesus taught people to be fishers for men, we need to engage in the battle for the souls of men. But again, not using the physical sword, but using the spiritual sword of God. I want to end with a passage which, after I studied it all, I said, well, I've got to find something that I think will reflect the idea I've wanted to com communicate. And that's 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness. But is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God loves every man. God wants every man to be saved. And you and I ought to think about what the Lord did when he put Malchus's ear back on. He cared about the man who was there to arrest him. When the Lord was on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What it was going to take was teaching these people and encourage them to repent, and they would turn their lives around. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to become one. We're going to sing the song, I Am Resolved. And if you're resolved no longer to linger, why not come as together we stand and sing. Uh-huh.
Well, it is good to see everyone back tonight and share in another period of worship. For those of you that may not have had the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, uh, we do have that left prepared for you now. If you want to make your way to the room here on my right, we have uh, brothers that have uh, been assigned to assist you with completing that part of your worship. Thank you again, Brother Tony, for another wonderful lesson from God's Word about how we sometimes need to put up the sword. I think we have been blessed today with two lessons uh, that are very well prepared and well presented, a good period of Bible study together. I'm sure it will help each of us to go out into the world and be the Christians that we need to be and help others to understand just how much God loves them and the gospel that He has uh, given so that they could be saved. Keep all those that were mentioned in the uh, announcements on our sick list. Keep them in your daily prayers. Call them, send them cards, encourage them. And uh, we hope that they can be back with us very soon. Start making your plans now for our upcoming gospel meeting. That will be April the 11th through the 14th with Brother Chad Ramsey. Don't forget to pick up your cards out in the foyer and use those to advertise the meeting. and Let everyone know uh, when the meeting will be taking place. And to make plans now to be back with us on Wednesday evening for our midweek Bible study. We'll be led in one more song and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. Paul.
Let us pray together. Our almighty and all loving heavenly Father, we're thankful, Father, for this Lord's Day. We're thankful for the lesson that we've heard tonight. We're thankful for each one here, Father. We pray, Father, that the lesson tonight has fallen up on good and honest hearts and bear much fruit for thy name's honor and glory. Heavenly Father, bless this congregation. Bless each one of us. Forgive us of our sins and be with those that are sick in the hospital, the nursing homes, and at home. Watch over and take care of them, Father, and be with the families that's lost loved ones. For we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>